thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a great opportunity to also talk to a very different crowd, so I'm certainly hoping I will be on time and let you uh, ask some questions. Because, you know, usually I speak to roboticists or colleagues and they uh, are still the same, as we say, fuck idiots. So they are idiots from the same niche of research as I am. Now, um, if you speak about robots to a uh, general public, what they usually, and especially in the connection to totality or any dangerously sounding words like that, what you usually imagine is something along these lines. So Terminator 2 and destruction and all that kind of stuff. Um, instead, I'd like, you, uh, I'd like to present today my view, because this is not an academic conference, then also some of my like, favorite projects and so on, connected to that decentralization and the changes which the robotic industry is bringing to the table. So first, I'll uh, say something about kind of wha what gives me the right a little bit to talk about that, what's the background, mentioned already in the introduction, and then I'll talk about what I consider as the four paths which could lead to robot digital or robot totality, and um, then I'll speak about the state of those paths. So as mentioned, I'm from the uh, CTU. Uh, our, our group is called the Humanoid Group, so actually we have just one humanoid robot currently, the small Nao, and it's older version. Um, the general idea of the research in our group is to re develop robots which uh, are safe, interact with the humans. We usually use all kinds of sensors uh, for skins, and the research is also to a big part based on so-called developmental robotics. That might be a keyword uh, interesting to some of you, where you research first what humans have, so for example this somatosensoric map in your brains, and then you try to recreate that with the robot. So we do a lot of research in that area, except for one guy in that group, which is me. Because what I do is basically industrial robotics, or modern industrial robotics with so-called collaborative robots, to which I'll get to. So usually it's all kinds of safety research uh, concerning that. But I won't go deep into that. Um, it might be boring for people who are not interested because the majority of that is just fighting a lot of legal battles, basically. Now, I'd like to mention one thing that many of the research which we do or which, ha which happens now in robotics is certainly multiplied by advances in machine learning. But because machine learning is quite a wide term and encompasses things which are not always necessarily connected to robots, uh, for example, in our case, we apply this open pose human detection framework, then I won't talk about that in the slides that much. I'll focus on the robots, with the exception of one joke, which will be there with machine learning. Now, also robots. I'm not sure how much you know about robots, what kinds of robots you've seen, but there's a ton. Basically, for any task, they're like nature spreading into every available niche. They create new robots everywhere for any purpose. I won't mention some whole categories of robots at all, for example, nautical robots and so on. But if you're interested, check out IEEE's Guide to Robots, where you can get a really nice glimpse of all sorts of robots. Now, let me get to the paths. There are basically, I would say, four basic paths how, I think, robot totality could come along. First, the classical one, war. Let's go and fight with the robots or the robots with us. Uh, SMBC has a really nice take on it that if the robots would be based on historical data, they probably won't won win because the majority of the battles were not with modern weapons. So, hopefully. Second option, uh, my beloved Philip Kinder Dick, and let's replace humans with robots. So instead of killing us, they'll just slowly permeate the society. You can, instead of second variety, which is not that popular, imagine Blade Runner or anything similar. The third path, I would say, is actually replacing us in the workforce. So just something which we see basically on a daily uh, basis nowadays, that many of the works can be automated, replaced. Again, a side note, 
I won't be talking about uh, automation, which might hit the majority of people who are sitting here, which is automation of white collar jobs, because what I'm mainly concerned with is the automation of blue collar jobs. But don't worry, any type of accountant or software operation, the iteration cycles of new software in that field are so fast, the majority of us might lose their jobs unless the human aspect is a contribution to the value very fast. So um, the last option I see is kind of like a symbiotic totality. Robots will be everywhere, like uh, from the, uh, the, the Rosie from that future old animated series. So they will help us in the household. Now, these are basically the path which we're looking at. They outlined, you might have some imagination of what they encompass, what they mean. But the actual situation can be quite different from what you expect. So let me go now from those least threatening to the more threatening ones. Household robots. This is a great, uh, great example from uh, the KIT, uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and the Asfors Humanoid Group, where they created a robot and they have like a whole kitchen with also a digital uh, twin to that kitchen where a robot is learning how to help us in households. A great example of exactly that servant helping out robot at home. You might have some misconceptions about why would we care about a robot which looks humanoid? Obviously, there's also like a, a factor of affinity, how friendly that robot might be, might seem more. But if any one of you saw Wally -E or anything, you know we can love a brick. Or if you see even R2D3, we can love a tin can. But humanoid robots have one big benefit. They are meant to be working in an environment which is already made for them, because all the environment we're in is basically prepared for us, because, hey, we inhabited it most of the time. So if you make a humanoid robot, you don't have to do any, hopefully, adjustments, as opposed to, you know, classical Daleks. If your robot can't get, on the, uh, can't get onto the upper floor because there are stairs, you have to have an elevator in your flat or house, or you can't use your, the robot in the upper rooms. And that's, again, some kind of friction which would limit the use of the robots. So that's the idea where ser service robots are often meant to look like or be close uh, to human buildup. Now, there are also some specialized robots at, in households already quite prevalent. So that's really helping to that presence everywhere. Uh, I can remember that uh, I was visiting that gardening robot, for example, which is in, in the Prague gardens of the Prague or the, the gardens of the Prague castle. I was visiting and looking at it and going like, oh, that's the future. There's like a gardening robot running. Two years later, basically every weekend house around the uh, Lipno Dam has a gardening robot just cutting grass there. So like, whoa, they're getting really spreading. But you can also see on this example of the iRobots Roombas or similars, how limited they are. So that's exactly the counterfeit uh, or counterexample that humanoid robot, that if there's just some stairs or if there's something spread on the ground or you just throw in a, your teddy bear on the ground, the Roomba will just have problems and mess up. The next thing, basically my field, yeah, is replacing humans in the workforce. So. Again, I like SMBC and XKCD, as, might, as you might have uh, guessed, and you were warned in the small annotation of the talk that they will be used. So uh, you can't complain. Um, so uh, in my field, the big thing about robotization is really replacing people in the workforce. There is a growing trend uh, of replacements. I should be aiming there, 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 click, 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 yeah. So there's a growing trend of replacements. You might notice a small dip in 2019, but the question is if it's actually a dip in the amount of robots around. These are new installations, thousands of numbers, but uh, industrial production usually runs for multiple years. So actually the, the density of robots is just growing, and the highest densities are maybe not surprisingly in Korea or 
South Korea, if we want to precise it, but I guess it's quite clear there won't be that many robots in North Korea and uh, Singapore and similar developed countries. Um, thanks to the really huge workforce in China, the density of robots is not that big, although China is now a leading uh, member of the, of the group of roboticizing countries around the world. A usual industrial production, if you haven't seen one yet, looks like this. Uh, the game you can play now is Spot the Human. I can tell you there are two, actually. So we have first one. He's just looking at something cool. And the other one is hiding from work, I guess. And all these robots are heavy weight, super powerful industrial robots. Uh, compared to those numbers which we've seen, we have here approximately 40, 50 Hyundai used, you see the mark, robots. And uh, this line can work really for multiple years till that car works, then they can switch. That's the main benefit of using robots, you can switch the production. And what you should notice in this moment for um, the future references, gates. This is a few fully roboticized line and the human can't enter. The instant you would enter this line, the robot has to have to stop. That will cost like a ton of money for the company if that happens. And it's simply for safety reasons. Such robots could crush you and they wouldn't probably, oh, they certainly wouldn't notice basically because they don't have the sensor for that. But they also wouldn't notice performance wise often. They're able to take the whole car, some of those types, just lift it, turn it around and do pivots and whatever. So if a meager 80 kilogram person is in the way, just pivot around him and he flies away, no problem. So those are the classical old industrial robots with gates and all that stuff. Now, there's some change happening. The change is in the context of, probably which you already know, uh, different industrial revolutions. So the first industrial revolution obviously came in coming up with the machinery at all. So before that, everything ideally was done manually. Then we start to use machines. Then we get into the digital time, uh, sorry, the technological revolution, where we actually add some knowledge about how to optimize those processes. And then we get to the uh, digital times when we add the digital industry. And what is currently kind of running is this industry. You can guess who named it, the Germans. So it's named Industry 4.0 because it's the fourth, great. And um, instead of you know, coming up with like si the synthesis revolution, where we synthesize the mechanical and the digital, because that's what's going on. I mentioned before already, digital twins. So what happens nowadays, for those who, who don't know, the talk is a little general, so if you know all this stuff, then why are you here? But um, uh, nowadays you have digital twins, so what can happen? I'm someone selling you robots. I can make a digital simulation of the whole industrial line with every pinpoint, every moment. And I can basically even contractually, so I'll, I'll give my money, I can contractually guarantee the production amount of that line. Because those simulations are so good and so close to reality, I can guarantee you, you will have this production output if you construct this line because I know all the materials, all the machines, all that stuff. And what's the coolest thing, as soon as I build that construction line, I can take the same software I used in the simulation to control the robot and just load it up into that robot and run it. When I need to change it, I can again iterate really fast in the software world, then put it into that industrial, actual mechanical setting. Great things. Also, uh, Additive manufacturing, so 3D printing, but in the industrial world buzzword style, is uh, also being used. So that's again the connection of I make some CAD models. I don't have, I don't need a guide and prepare the actual physical version. I just send it to the machine and print it right away. Uh, all a lot of me metallic printing is already on the way and being done. So that's already basically old. What we're now in, 
And you can guess it because we already have the precedent of 4.0, so everyone is lazy to come up with some new options. So it's usually named, oh, we're getting into 5.0. Oh, damn. Some innovation, if you're speaking about innovation. Then it's still not finished, and it's still just being born. So that's why I have question marks here. But the general idea is we had this movement of industrialization where basically the human was pushed aside. You had mass-produced stuff, which was always the same, and so on. What if, and we'll see if it will settle on that, because maybe it's just, you know, to tell people who are stressed out about the robots that, don't worry, we're bringing you back into the loop. And not. We'll see. But it's currently being evolved that, or discussed that the fifth industrial revolution would be bringing the person back in, so that you currently, if I use those words, could add your artisan knowledge to mass production. So we have that efficiency of basically mass production, but you can tweak it always. You can create smaller batches. Those cars, they are produced in enormous, huge numbers. But smaller companies or big companies creating smaller batches of products, even replacement parts or everything, is what is being now done as the new style of industry. With the obvious hybridization of the physical and digital before, the hopes now, and we don't have to go to Musk and his Neuralink and all that kind of stuff, but uh, the hopes are now to create basically like a joint enterprise of people, robots, digital world, mechanical world, and so on. So what we're in is basically this 4.0 or 5.0 industry currently. But as you've seen with the industrial robots, those are basically industrial machines. If a person comes near them, the machine should stop because otherwise it's really strongly probable he'll lose a limb or something. Maybe in the 19th century, it was manageable to have a few accidents and it was cost efficient. But nowadays you can go so sued and screwed that the uh, companies usually prefer not to hurt their employees, usually. For example, Amazon actually turned out, uh, I can reference that article if someone is more interested in that, lied about the number of accidents with their robots. So, usually. At least the small and medium uh, companies I'm working with, they usually care quite a lot about their employees. So, what can we do for that is use these collaborative robots. I'll mention two names because I really like them. Uh, not the names, but the people represented by those names. Let, let's not get into philosophy of representation and names and labeling. But one of those is Sami Hadadin, uh, so a great researcher, uh, and he's doing collaborative robots. Just a side note on this moment. Um, as I mentioned, collaborative robots are supposed to be safe. Forks and knives, no. You can't have forks and knives in your robot and consider it safe. But there's a really nice trick if you're dealing with uh, collaborative robots and research. And that's if you're the researcher who's doing the research, you can do the experiments on yourself and there's no ethical committee which necessarily needs to know. Because, hey, it's your research, your guarantee, your problem. So Sami has a great contribution in bringing in the collaborative robots into the mainstream, mainly because, as I mentioned, the original robots were industrial, big, dangerous machines. So when they changed the perception for the new collaborative robots, everyone was basically following the same rules of industrial machines, dangerous, don't come near it. Sami was the awesome guy who came like, that's not true. We can control those robots, we can design those robots, and we can then build those robots in such a way that nothing actually happens to the person. So this is an already a really old series of experiments where he hit himself and showed that basically any collision with those robots was fine. Obviously, this is like a controlled experiment. So in practice, there might be a lot of other problems which might happen. But uh, the general attitude currently, so that's a battle which we are fighting now, is to convince the general public first also that the robots are safe, but convince also the professionals from industries that robots are safe. 
especially these collaborative robots when designed for that. And my research is actually also aiming at making the, the industrial robots safe so that people could collaborate directly with them. There are some pitfalls, some problems which you can face, but let me only mention that uh, the, the main problem there is basically really that legal issue that uh, currently you can't basically use that robot in production without having repercussions if, if the person would get hit or anything. Um, now, this switch, let, let me hit Sammy once more. So, he really enjoyed that and he's a really cool guy. Now, uh, for those, for, for the next step basically in that research, For the next step in that research to, to replace us ideally, one of the places where people work and build are the robot factories where they, fac where they build the robots. So ideally, let's us replace humans who build robots with robots which will build robots. This is a, actually, um, it might sound like I'm doing uh, advertisement to some companies. I'm not tied to them in any way. I don't get any money from them. I just think they're awesome, so sorry. But, um, Franca Amica, which is Sami's uh, company, builds these panda robots, or has these panda robots, and the TQ Systems company is building them. When we visited them, we saw a prime example of roboticization in practice. The original line, they told us, was man prepared, man manufactured. You had different positions, classical line, production, someone screws something in, someone melts something in, blah, blah, blah. So everyone does his job. And they slowly, you know, came and, hey, Tom, you don't, you don't have to come tomorrow anymore. We'll move, you, we'll move you somewhere else. And they shove a new robot into there. When we arrived to check their, com their company and the factory, there was one poor guy just like working his job. Otherwise, there were all these robots. And two things, first thing, he could work alongside the robots. There weren't those gates. These are safer, collaborative robots. Second thing, when we were standing next to him, the, sh the, the boss of the company just went and, yeah, and I think we'll have his position done in like a month. <laughs> so it's just a question of time when he'll be replaced. But what's really important also to realize, these are tasks which are reasonably simple and they have to be prepared for the robot. They have to be constructed so that the robot can do it. You have, there's some person, still not fully automated to generate these, but there's a person who thinks, okay, if I need to screw this in, I either change the design of the, the component so that the robot can screw it in correctly, or I have to find a way how the, some tools, some help, which would allow the robot to screw a component in correctly. There is one example from that robotization company, which was really cool about like, the, the production augmentation, when originally there was a task to test some uh, circuits. The original work was, you close the machine, you wait for the green or red light, depending on the light, you put the piece left or right. Awesome job, right? Now, what they did was, this could be done by a robot, so now they have four of these machines. A robot is doing that closing, opening, gets a signal from the evaluator if that piece is correct, throws the piece out. And one person is doing more uh, unstructured work around, but his responsibility or her responsibility is also to check the robots. So it's like a supervisor, you know, there's a robot kindergarten, they're working, and if one of the robots starts shouting that there's a problem, you go there, you pat him on the back, you correct the problem, and you let him continue working. So you have like a fourfold improvement in the production and the person basically doesn't lose a job because all those people who understood the technical testing process are still useful in the other parts of the process of the production. Another name I would mention is Esben Oestegaard because he's the founder of the Universal Robots. Because if you understand a little bit of economics or something or companies or you have your own companies, and didn't waste your time doing PhDs or stuff like me, then um, you understand that you need to have a return on your investment. Those big industrial robots, they cost a lot. They are often, some of those are custom made, so it's like even extra lot. But Esben came and went like, hey, the majority of the tasks we want to do with the robots are actually reasonably stupid. We don't need a 
thousandth of a millimeter precision for the robot, which those industrial cool robots always have, and everyone boasts like our robot is the most precise one, and our robot is the most powerful one. And how is it with the expenses? Yeah, he's also the most expensive one. Esben came along and went like, let's build shitty robots which are good enough and use them. And his universal robots are certainly not the best on the market you can buy, but they're quite good. For most of the tasks, that's enough. And so he helped a lot in bringing in a lot of collaborative robots into the market and helping a lot of smaller and medium companies roboticize. So there's also this economical aspect of the whole thing. So that's why I put him into this like hall of fame of two people I mentioned. Now, uh, a term which I'd like to share with you also is the 4D, originally 3D, but you know, 3D is lame, let's go 4. Next time we'll have 5D, I don't know what will be the 5D, but 4D of roboticization. First, we, we, what we want to roboticize, you know, kind of robot propaganda. We want to roboticize the tasks which are dangerous. We don't want our employees to be facing danger, you know, boiling aluminum or a dull, you know, the testing machine. I don't want to do that for eight hours, 12 hours straight. Um, or which are actually dirty. So again, boiling aluminum or, or painting maybe, a lot of car and similar stuff. Or tasks which are dear, so expensive, is uh, the less employee taking into account part. However, let me share some insights from my experience when we went to companies which wanted to place robots into their production. It's easier said than done. For example, not these. I, I just This is the only image I found really fast about people pouring boiling aluminum somewhere from, a, I think it's Zambian or South African, I don't know what company. But um, we were to a Czech company which does aluminum molding and so on. They wanted us to roboticize basically this kind of job. So it's dirty, it's dangerous. And uh, we said, no way. Why? Because it's dirty. There's, there's like so much vapors, so much dust. If you place there a camera, it will be, if not destroyed directly, it will be just smidged with all that dust and it won't recognize anything. And then they went like, but, but it's done by a human, yeah, but, and, and he's just pouring stuff. Is he really just pouring stuff? If you want to roboticize something, the best question to ask is, is he really just doing X? Because if he's really just pouring something, then it would be easy, but he's not actually just pouring something. He's pouring and watching what's going on. So you would need to have something which would give him feedback if the pouring is too slow, too fast, da 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 da. So a lot of problems. So these guys actually are one of the best protected against robotization. Now, for the replacement of us. Uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro is a really fun guy, Japanese professor at the Osaka University, who's making these geminoids which try to look at, like him or his colleagues. Uh, sometimes he replaces himself at a conference with a geminoid, or did that a while ago. Uh, for those of you who didn't recognize, this is the person, this is the robot. Um, but these are usually also telepresence robots. So he's actually controlling the robot directly. There's not much smartness. A lot different to that is obviously probably well known by you, Boston Dynamics and their awesome work on uh, Atlas. And on that, I would mention one more name basically, um, Jürgen uh, Schmidhuber, who's into machine learning, a uh, founding father from Switzerland. But he claims or he, he thinks there's probably like an accelerating timeline of improvements that every step towards a robot future basically takes only a quarter of the time which the previous step took. So, you know, if it took 40 years to do X, it will take only 10 to get to the next part of maybe now having fully robotic synthetic brains and so on. However, I wouldn't be that enthusiastic because these videos, don't, rem don't forget, this company still, now it even offers their products on the market. It was in the oversight of DARPA, so they try to look good. What actually can happen in unstructured environments is just a lot of failings. 
not, I'm not a member of the Czech team of, uh, that took part now in the new DARPA Subterrane Challenge and scored high score, high points. But from their experience, I know that even nowadays, it's still a lot of tinkering, a lot of minute, minute human work to make sure that the robots actually perform as we expect. An interesting part is also to show it shortly, to, so that you take away also another message. Something that looks complicated in robotics doesn't have to be actually that complicated. This might look, you see, a UR hand, but the QB hand is a really interesting because it's, you might think that's like a human hand and it's awesome and it has to have a lot of sensors and stuff. There's just a lot of well-placed strings, similar as in our hands, tendons and stuff. And you just pull one motor to close and open. But because of the freedom, so-called under-actuated joint, it will accustomate to the shape. So it looks like a real human hand just changing gears. One company which does this kind of bio-inspired stuff really well, in my view, is Festo. So if you're into bio-inspired stuff, check out Festo. They have tentacles and all that kind of weird stuff. So the last part which I mentioned, or as first, was the war with robots. So an XKCD joke for pre-last or final slides. One thing why we are probably afraid of robots, uh, I've read even recently, I am not sure to, who, to whom I could attribute that quote, but the fears about uh, superintelligence and AI are founded in our fears that it will behave the same way as we do to lesser beings or less intelligent beings. So for the question of if robot war is on, if there will be a Terminator, I can answer only, there is a predator. Why would you need a Terminator? These things can do what a Terminator should do basically better. And the only reason they're not killing us basically autonomously, legal reasons. We still try to have a person in the loop, so it's Industry 5.0, off killing, with a person in the loop who has to push the button to shoot. But basically all the decisions already, choice of targets, everything, are automated. So, uh, so the, uh, basically, as XKCD put it in the commentary to the previous comic, at some moment, we went into that Skynet-style future. We just didn't notice because it wasn't that flashy and sudden and everything, as usual with the with, uh, future. It doesn't look like in the sci-fis. No one really, I guess, predicted uh, bitcoins and similars, but we have those. No one predicted predators and similars, but we have those. We don't have terminators. But so that I don't leave you with a really dark future, uh, I'll give you Cosmo. A prime example of a really small, cute, stupid robot where our perception of the robot gives or makes 90% maybe of what's going on. The robot is really simple, but it shows the right digital eyes and we think, oh, it's cute and it's, it's now angry. That's, that's so cute, the small, tiny robot. So that's for me. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. So thank you for the presentation and uh, so far, we are going to get to, to the questions. Uh, one question from the online is like people just would like to know the site with different types of the robot you show on the beginning of your presentation. If you could please just tell us what was that. Uh, what did you say the, of the robot? The site with the robots. You have it like third slide maybe. Uh, third slide. Do, 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 do. This one. This yep. one. Oh, yep. that's IEE. -E. If you look at IEEE, then uh, I think it's called like robot. Yeah, I think it's just robot guide or something like that. So they have there a lot of small uh, or examples of the robots, how they're used, what they're good for, and so on. Okay, thank you. So we can follow with the next. So I, I have two questions. The one is you showed the, the car production line and said it's about 40 robots there. Is that can you can you put a price tag on it? Is like one million per robot, so it's forty million, or 
Uh, just a rough number, not not a precise or exact number. And the second thing I want to know is, uh, you you mentioned software where you simulate the robots in advance, so you can see how they would behave, and you can test your algorithms. I assume, is this open source software? Does open source software exist, or is this all proprietary, or is this very expensive software? Or is this something you can afford and get? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, so concerning the price of industrial robots. Those big robots, I don't know the exact price tags because they're usually business to business negotiated, but I can assure you a million, even if you speak about euros, doesn't matter, is not the lower limit. The big, a big industrial robot, one of those arms which is able to weld a car and so on will go certainly above a million euros, I would say. We have, for example, the UR robots, again, that's more, a lack of my remembering of how much we paid for that, but that was around millions of crowns. So they are really expensive. The cheapest robot which we got was maybe in in multiple, like maybe 800,000 or so, and it's just like a small robot arm like this. Um, concerning the software, depends. There's a company, let me have a negative example of a company, KUKA, they do quite cool robots and indu big industrial robots and they're high quality, high price. And they have closed Windows-based Java-loving software. Hate it. And they're not that much keen on supporting open source alternatives for control. Uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, Kinova, which do those small arms used usually for help for uh, people who, are, who have some movement impairment then uh, those have uh, open source controls. Uh, it's, they have a GitHub repository, which you can just check out and fork and do whatever you want. And then there's also robotic uh, operating systems, which are open sourced, uh, developed by the community, with, uh, with a kind of similar uh, business model as uh, I think Red Hat has or something, that basically the code is open sourced if you want service or Apache licenses and stuff. Yeah, the code is open source, you can take it and do it as uh, do with it what you want in your projects. But if you want help from us, from a company which has a lot of experience, then you can pay like consultants to help you out. So there is opportunity. There are also open source designs for robots available. Okay, are there any questions in the audience? So maybe maybe I will take the last one because we have a few minutes still. So 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 my my point of view, like talking with people, for example, working in my Amazon, uh, uh, the way how how the how the everything they do uh, within the warehouses, how it's controlled and limited, but it's automated systems. So I want to ask, like, how you deal with this, uh, th this uh, like kind of direction when, when this like because you talk about collaboration and I think these cobots and like human in the loop will be very important. But right now, what I think and what I see, what I see from from these uh, interviews I did with the people is the the feeling of alienation. You know, it's still like not happening. So are you dealing with in your research or could you have maybe a little bit such as on this? Um, I would say like the the ideal example of Mm, human-robot collaboration we're aiming at are really those where the robot would enhance your abilities by being a good assistant. So uh, you have, for example, a robot which can help you. Um, what we're working, for example, on is, is the robot has quite a good payload to who, who, what, she, what he is able to carry. So let's say 8 kilos, 20 kilos, and so on. So he can carry, for example, that thing, that, that heavy machine which you're supposed to use. And in a so-called hands-on control, you're basically just moving around the machine and welding or doing whatever. So that's where the person is still present. And maybe because of the small batch, maybe in, in for example, car repairs, the, the trace or the, the, the path you have to take is every single time different. So you would have to take a, someone, program the new path for the robot, and then you could weld it. It's a lot cheaper to take a guy and ask him, hey, you're an experienced welder, but I don't want you to have sore muscles and be tired after welding two cars and then have to take a break. I'd prefer if you can weld it easily 
and then you can do more cars in the day. Or at least you won't finish your career after a few years because you are destroyed your back. So that's kind of the, the ideal idea where it's not uh, exactly as in Amazon, like an alienated, roboticized basically task where for now we have a human because we didn't come up with a robot to do the job. Okay, thank you. So maybe maybe the last thing because when I introduced you, I was uh, so there. There is, for example, like just a little bit of uh, of. For example, there is this artist called uh, Stellark who is trying, you know, to enhance his body with different kind of robotic system, like uh, like so like extra ear or extra arm. Yeah. So we have even in art we can find this exploration of how we can get. Uh, uh, somehow the, to, to develop this collaboration, but when I introduced you, I started with uh, Chapek, uh, you know, to bring you on the floor. So I think that the best way how we can talk this, uh, how we can finish this talk with is Asimov. So should we rely on three loves of robotics, or <laughs> is there any anything we could like first in the future, like what will? Um, I don't remember now if it's on the number file or the computer file channel because those are really good channels on uh, YouTube about mathematics and computers and so on. But there's a, a roboticist there talking about exactly the Asimov laws. The drawback of the Asimov laws is simply in the fact that they're stated um, in human language and anyone who writes software knows that as soon as you would go deeper into what do you act actually mean by this? Like, you know, don't harm a human. Can I, can I like harm, no, like totally no harm? So I can't even inject a needle? No, 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 that's okay. Why? You said no harm and that person feels pain when I inject the needle. Oh damn, we can't have medical robots now or what's going on? So Asimov laws are an artistic rendition, artistic idea, which in practice, uh, Sami, for example, started out with the love to Asimov, but in practice, you can't really use them. Sadly. <laughs> no, 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 just that was a little bit expecting. So thank you for your presentation. <laughs>